Montgomery, Alabama, the birthplace of the civil rights movement, where a community of leaders and everyday citizens joined together to end segregation. Some chose to work in the spotlight, while others worked in the shadows. Their acts of courage and defiance started a movement that spread across the nation. Sitting for Justice, the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Sponsored by Alabama State University and SPLC's Civil Rights Memorial. I attended Alabama State. It was at that time Alabama State uh, College for Negroes. Now it's Alabama State University. I enrolled there in December of 1947 and graduated in May of 1951. While I was there, I came for the purpose of learning how to become a teacher. Uh, as I grew up in Montgomery in the 30s and 40s, there were basically two professions that African-American boys could think about, and they would be preaching or teaching. Either one you did, you did it on a segregated basis because everything was segregated. They thought I could would develop into a pretty good preacher, so they sent me to high school up in Nashville, National Christian Institute, to learn how to preach. When I finished and came back, I lived on the west side of town, 705 West Jeff Davis. I was going to Alabama State on the east side and had to use the transportation system. And I recognized that our problem, our African Americans in Montgomery at that time were having problems on, on how they were treated on the buses. Black people riding the buses would pay their fares at the front. You know how you put your money in the, you, put, you, pay, you pay your fare at the front. Then you had to get off the bus, go all the way to the back to get a seat that was reserved for black people, okay? Some bus drivers would just drive off before, <laughs> before they could get on the bus. So I made a personal, private commitment that I would go ahead, finish law school, or finish Alabama State, go to somebody's law school. I didn't know any lawyers, but they told me that lawyers uh, help people to solve problems, and I thought we had problems at Montgomery. But my whole idea and my secret desire was to go attend law school, finish law school, come back to Alabama, pass the bar exam, become a lawyer, and destroy everything segregated I could find. And on September the 7th, I was licensed to practice law in the state of Alabama and have been practicing ever since September 7th, 1954. There were two worlds. There was a black world and a white world. Uh, white people were all of the elected officials at that time, but uh, everything was completely segregated. And uh, you knew it, and there were people who were trying to solve some problems, but we had problems with racism and problems with inequality, and those problems had existed in Alabama and throughout the country ever since slavery time or when we were first brought here in, what, 1607 or 1608. I can't think of any aspect of life in Montgomery and in the South for that matter that was not governed by segregation. The bus boycott lasts for 382 days. So that's a long period of time. There were a lot of things that took place. There was a lot of persons involved, but there were very few people who were involved in it initially. And I'm probably the only living person of those who were originally involved in the planning of the Montgomery bus boycott from December 1st to December 5th. Black people boycotted the streetcars in Montgomery, I'm told, about 1900. 
And uh, for a while they were successful, but then they went back to the same things and we had those same problems over until Mrs. Parks did what she did. Because as you know, there were other people who had had problems on the buses and uh, Joanne Robinson had had problems. She wasn't arrested, but she had had problems on the bus in uh, uh, 1948. And there had been that type situation all the way through. All y'all really from Alabama. The straitjackets of race prejudice and discrimination do not wear only Southern labels. The subtle psychological technique of the North has approached in its ugliness and victimization of the Negro, the outright terror and the open brutality of the South. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., why we can't wait. This here, the cradle of this here nation. Everywhere you look, roots run right back south. Every vein filled with red dirt, blood, cotton. We the dirty words you spit out your mouth. Mason Dixon is an imagined line. You can theorize it or wish it real, but it's the same old ghost, see-through benign. All y'all from Alabama, we the wheel turning cotton to make the nation move. We the scapegoat in a land built from death. No longitude or latitude disproves the truth of founding father's sacred oath. We hold these truths like dark snuff in our jaw. Black oppressions, not happenstance, it's law. Claudette was 15 years old. She lived in a community known as uh, King Hill, northeastern part of the city. And uh, she had uh, been to school that day and the kids, the black kids, and this is a small black community surrounded by whites. And uh, they would use the public transportation to go from there, downtown, transfer, get another bus, go out to Booker Washington School, where they went to school. And on this particular day, they uh, uh, were let out of school early. I think the teachers were having a meeting or something. And those kids, instead of getting the bus from Union Street, where Booker Washington was, and uh, walked to and get Oak Park bus and go downtown. They just walked downtown to get the bus to go home. The bus was at full capacity and uh, the bus driver asked for two, the, he asked for the four seats. I don't know, four of the students got up, oh, three of the students got up and I remained seated. They reluctantly got up because they got up, got up and stood up. It was only this, the other white people didn't want to sit there because those, it's ridiculous. But those, I wasn't sitting in the white section, I was sitting in the color section. But white people would, would want to sit in the color section and the, and the colored people wasn't allowed to sit in the white section if there was empty seats. So this white lady had the whole seat uh, opposite me, but she wasn't going to sit in that seat because I was sitting across from her. And the driver asked her to get up again. He said, well, we've been studying a black, about Black History Month, and they had in February, and that she uh, uh, was not sitting in those first ten seats reserved for whites. She paid her fare, and she wasn't going to move. I didn't get up. I told the people I didn't get up because history had me glued to the seat. And when they said, well, this, how is that? I said, oh, I felt as so John the True Vance were pushing me down on one shoulder and Harriet Tubman hands were pushing me down on another. My mind was on all our heroes. I wasn't going to be made a 
you know, a spectacle for them that day. I was just going to do something that was really going to shake them up. I was going to rebel against them because I knew they was doing wrong. That was unfair and I wasn't breaking the law. Patrolman came to the back door and he asked me why was I sitting there and I told him I paid my fare and it's my constitutional rights and he's, he yelled back to the driver that he had no jurisdiction here. So they must have discussed that that they could he could make no arrest, right? The traffic patrolman. And that was a petition at the court square where you and uh, there was colored people there waiting for their bus and white to so I guess he said to keep from having a riot or something. He was um, told him to drive down one block. After we got to Bibb and Commerce Street, a uh, two squad car policemen came and they come to the back door. And they asked me the same question and they was even more rude. And uh, the guy, one uh, uh, grabbed me by the arm and, uh, because I refused, told you, I told you I was glued to the seat. And so they had to unglue me from the seat. So the balance blew him in front of the seat. They had to manhandle me and drag me off the bus because I refused to walk. They took me and booked me. And then after they took me and booked me, they took me. They didn't take me to a juvenile facility. They took me to an adult jail, to the city jail. And that's where uh, my uh, pastor and my mother came and uh, got me out. And I think that uh, now I'm thinking I'm, I'm glad that I'm getting some recognition now from what I did. And that now my grandchildren and that my son, my surviving son, can see that their mother, my son can see that his mother and my grandchildren can see that their grandmother stood up for something right. We love you. We love you. Come on now. But once she was arrested, the community became involved. The Women's Political Council, of which Joanne Robinson was one of the leaders, uh, immediately came to her rescue, and she had had a problem on the buses before, and uh, uh, arranged a meeting with the city officials and the bus company officials on Claudette Collins' case. And black leaders, including me, was invited to that meeting. They listened and said they were sorry about what happened to Claudette and that uh, it wouldn't happen again. Of course, we know it did happen again. We later found out that Mary Louise Smith was arrested uh, in October of 55. And of course, after that, Mrs. Parks was arrested in December of 55. On December 1, 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a Montgomery bus. Four days later, on December 5th, African Americans boycotted the buses in Montgomery, Alabama in protest of how they were treated on buses. I had known Ms. Parks since the time I was uh, in college and she lived two or three blocks in uh, Carver Court uh, from where I went to church. She was working at the Montgomery Fair, a department store in, uh, a few blocks, a, a block and a half from where my office was. So she would come from her office, from her shop, Montgomery Fair, to my office for lunch every day. We'd sit down and, and we'd talk. We'd talk about her work with the youth. We'd talk about segregation uh, generally. We talk about desegregating the schools. Brown versus the Board of Education had been decided. 
And we talked about if a person decided that they were asked to get up and give their seat on a bus to do so, how should they react? And we had done that, and we had done it from the time I opened my practice, which would have been probably in October of uh, 55, until she was arrested. We had our same type conference on December 1st. She knew, because I told her during the course of our conference, that I had a conference out of town that uh, week, that afternoon. She went on back to work, and of course, I ended up uh, going on my appointment and when I got back, I had a lot of calls from a lot of people, including Ms. Robinson and including Ms. Parks. And when I returned her call, she invited me to come over to her house. She, and she related to me what had taken place on her case. I was not surprised that if the opportunity presented itself, that she probably would not give up her seat. I don't think she was interested in getting arrested. I think she was interested in maintaining where she was, and she did. A case was set for Monday morning at 8.30, and the recorder's court of the city of Montgomery wanted me to represent her. And when we talked, I told her, I said, well, Ms. Parks, uh, this is Thursday. I'll get your case ready for Monday. Don't worry about it. I'll be back in touch with you between now and then. But I also told her, so as you know, Ms. Robinson has been talking about getting the community involved uh, in this whole problem of solving problems for a long time. So while I think you have done everything you need to do, I'm going to talk to Mr. Nixon. Of course, he had gotten her out, so he was familiar with it. And he knew that I was going to talk with him, see what he thought about getting the community involved. Then if he thought well of it, I was going to go and talk to Joanne Robinson and see what she thought and see what they could be doing about getting the community involvement to, so that there would be some sort of protest when she was arrested. Uh, the Women's Political Council. Mary Fair Burks was the first president. Joanne Robinson followed her as president a few years later. So these were activists women. And these women are the ones that started the bus boycott. I went, talked to Mr. Nixon. He thought it was a good idea, but he also said, he said, Fred, you know, uh, uh, I'm a poor man car and I'm going to have to leave town and go. Uh, but I will work with you. You talk to Joanne Robinson, get back in touch with me. Let me know what you all decide, we'll see what we could do. I left his place, went to Joanne Robinson's house, talked to her. We concluded two or three things in our conversation. One, if, if we were going to uh, have a protest and get the community involved, now is the time to do it. Secondly, so if we're involved, it's going to take the two black leaders in Montgomery to be supporting it. E.D. Nixon and Rufus Lewis. Well, I knew about uh, E.D. Nixon. I, I knew all Rufus Lewis. I didn't know him like I did her, but he owned uh, uh, a nightclub. But he was interested in getting people registered to vote and interested in getting uh, persons held accountable once they were elected. So we needed both of them. And what she says, if we're going to get a spokesman, and if it's going to go beyond a day, we're going to need a spokesman. And we're going to need both of these men to support us. So she said, Fred, I tell you, who we need as our spokesman is uh, my pastor, Martin Luther King. Haven't been here long, but he can move people with words. I said, well, that's what we need. Alabama has given only begrudging obedience to the federal law and the spirit of the Constitution of the United States. The Negro, for the most part, has been rendered politically important through the poll tax, literacy tests, and the naked physical intimidation. The right to vote, in fact, does not exist for the black man in Alabama. 
I said, well, if we see if we can get him to do that. And then I have two suggestions for these two leaders. E.D. Nixon knows A. Philip Randolph, who's president of his Pullman Carl Porter's Union in New York, get him to be the treasurer, and his president will help him raise some money to all of the finance what we're going to be doing. What you're going to do with Rufus Lewis? Well, I said, Rufus Lewis' wife, Jewel, is co-owner of the largest funeral home in town, George Clayton Funeral Home. They have cars, and they have drivers of those cars, and they only use them when they have funerals. Let's make him chairman of the Transportation Committee, and his wife will get that funeral director and all the others in town. And there's one other thing you're going to need. You're going to need to get uh, the preachers involved in this too because you're going to have to get the announcement. And at that time, you probably had more people in church, blacks, on Sunday morning than any other time. And somewhere along the line, I said, you know, you just might need a lawyer. And here am I, said me. Those were the plans that we made. The interesting thing about the two of us who were making these plans is we could not, neither one of us, it couldn't come out that we were making the plans. Because if so, Mrs. Robinson would have been fired from her job at Alabama State and I would have been disbarred for stirring up litigation. Joe Ann Gibson Robinson is that lady fearless and how she could know that she needed to stay in the background because you had a governor and Alabama State being a state supported institution. And if the governor were to find out what to discover, someone at Alabama State, this state supported institution, was behind starting all of this ruckus, that person would have been fired. We assigned to each other various responsibilities. One of the things Joanne said she was going to do, she was going to go and get a leaflet ready so they could get out. Joanne Robinson and the Women's Political Council met that same night and that next day and drafted a letter for a boycott of the buses. Don't ride the bus to work, to town, to school, or any place. Monday, December 5th, another Negro woman has been arrested and put in jail because she refused to give up her bus seat. Don't ride the buses to work, to town, to school, or anywhere on Monday. If you work, take a cab or share a ride or walk. Come to a mass meeting Monday at 7 p.m. at the Holt Street Baptist Church for further instruction. She took that draft, came to Alabama State's campus, went to the mimeograph office, she grabs two of her students and they run off these flyers announcing a bus boycott, right? Edie Nixon on, at a, on a parallel track, track is calling folks, including Martin Luther King, right? So, and, and then they all meet the next day. And, and the, the men sort of resolve to, to join these women in this, in this protest. Mr. Nixon, when I told him, he said, what I'm gonna do for, I'm gonna call the chairman of the ministerial allowance, ask him to set up a meeting where the community can meet together on tomorrow night, Friday night, because I'll be going to Chicago and I won't be back until after that. Those were the plans, that's what took place. We sowed the seed and all of it came together and that was the beginning of the Montgomery Bus Support Club. Women played a pivotal role before and during the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Ultimately, it was four women, Aurelia Browder, Susie McDonald, Claudette Colvin, and Mary Louise Smith, who agreed to be plaintiffs in Browder versus Gale. The lead plaintiff was Aurelia Browder. Well, Aurelia Browder had the fortune or misfortune to be born to uh, civic-minded 
a father, Josh Shine, who um, assisted in the organization of the first boycott in Montgomery in 1901. Uh, and the principles of equal rights on the Constitution was instilled in her from, from almost childhood. She was always interested in the movement, part of the NAACP, part of the MIA, part of uh, Women's Political Council. So she, she was, that was her involvement in, in the community. In April 1955, my mother suffered her last arrest on a bus by the bus driver. And she went to Edie Nixon, who at the time had influence with the NAACP, and asked them for their support of her as a litigant in a lawsuit against the, the racism on the buses. During that time, though, the, most people now understand that, that people could be arrested by the police, as were Rosa Parks, uh, Claudette Carvin, and Mary Louise Smith Ware, along with a host of other people from, from uh, 1896 uh, when the law uh, went into place. Um, but they didn't, a lot of them don't understand that the bus drivers also had that authority. And it was my mother's fate to be, have been arrested at least twice by the bus driver. Um, but when she talked to Edie Nixon about being a plaintiff, he, he didn't feel like she would be a good plaintiff. The reason that, that she was given was that she was too outspoken and too, too uh, self-sustaining. Rosa Parks couldn't be the plaintiff because of her litigation in city court. And they knew that if they went to city court, they would lose as the city had already indicted 189 people uh, for um, uh, violations they said were in connection to operating an illegal carpool and having the boycott. The Sprague case went through the uh, uh, Alabama Court of Appeals and she was ultimately uh, found guilty. There was another case we filed, Browder versus Gale, the community talk to people to see who they thought would make good plaintiffs in the federal lawsuit once they decided to do that. But they only decided to do that after Dr. King's house was born. And once they made that decision and the people, they brought them to my office and I talked with them, the ones that I thought should be plaintiffs, I so told them and they authorized me to do it. Mrs. Browder was in it, uh, Claudette Carving through her parents uh, were in it, uh, Miss McDonald was in it, and uh, Mary Louise Smith and her father were all parts of it. And it is that case, a Browder versus Gale case, that ultimately went to the Supreme Court that declared segregation on the buses in Montgomery to be unconstitutional. I don't know a stronger person, man or woman, than Aurelia Browder. Uh, she was my example. Uh, the, the, most people ask me, who's, who's a man in my life? I said, Aurelia Browder. I said, that was your mama. Yeah, that was my mama. That was a man in my life. Uh, she was a rock. I want her to be remembered as a person who stood up for what she believed in, who um, made her contribution not based on notoriety or popularity, but because she felt it was the right thing to do. Um, she didn't look for any accolades as a result of it, although she got quite a few. Most people that knew her knew what she had done. I think, uh, I know that uh, Reverend Say wrote about in, in his book, Joanne Robinson in her book. Um, so uh, she got her, she used to always say, give me my flowers while I'm alive, and she got her flowers. So um, her example to each of us should be to stand up for what we believe in. Well, however many are standing, if we're standing by ourselves. There's a monument downtown on um, um, commemorating Rosa Parks. And I, I was asked to um, sit on a committee to comment on that monument. And, and I, I asked that the four other women who were plaintiffs in the Browder versus Gale case be a part of that monument. And if you go to that monument and you look on the ground on the four corners around Rosa Parks, she's standing on the shoulders of those women, including Claudette Colvin, who 
um, who were arrested before her, before her, who took a seat or a stand before um, Rosa Parks. The whole movement would not have been successful without them, you know, because they, they were critical. Um, they provided support you know, and you talk about, and these were women, you know, for the most part. So the women were kind of behind the scenes, you know, except for Rosa Parks, who stepped out there. And like Rosa Parks stepped out there. There were women, these were women. Claudette Colvin, Aurelia Browder, Mary Smith, Rosa Parks. These were women who stepped out there and got this movement going. It is entirely possible for a black girl to be loved. See me, black as I am, and call me beautiful. No revolution necessary, no brave needed, just loving me. It is not unusual to love me, black as I am. It is not because I'm so strong, so exotic, so walk on the wild side, what side? See my skin, it's not chocolate or coffee or caramel. It is inedible. It is nothing to see with colonizers' eyes, nothing to trap with pity or praise, nothing to bruise to make purple with your power. My skin is soft like anything soft. It is a reflection of God. It is a heavenly mirror. Don't you see that? You're there too. Black as I am, I can shine anything back. Even the sun wants to cling to me. Fred David Gray was a difference maker. He provided the difference between night and day for black life. To give you an idea of what we're saying, Reverend Solomon Say Sr., Edgar D. Nixon, when a black person experienced police brutality, a young black woman was raped, that later found her way to the home of Solomon Say Sr., Edgar D. Nixon, sometime it might be two o'clock in the morning, and they would go to City Hall to plead that person's case. But that was about it. But with Fred Gray, things began to change. And as fate would have it, Fred Gray would not have to work alone. A young minister came to Montgomery to assume the pulpit of historic Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. He would provide the persuasiveness and framing it in religious terms and philosophical terms. And when he combined that with what Fred Gray brought from the legal side, all of a sudden, black Montgomerians and white persons in this town who embraced justice could say, we now have the dawn of a new day in the capital city. The bus boycott had a tremendous impact. It is ground zero for the modern civil rights movement. It is ground zero for a, 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 a campaign that would marry um, nonviolent civil disobedience, church-based um, mass mobilization, religious, leadership, um, direct action, and, and litigation, all into one movement. So the, the bus boycott had all of those components, and it, it, it married those components into a movement, a movement that could be replicated, intentionally replicated, throughout the South. So, so out of the bus boycott and out of the Montgomery Improvement Association, you had the creation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference which the founders, Martin Luther King and his lieutenants, 
they created the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, to do around the South what the Montgomery Improvement Association did in Montgomery. So it was very intentional. And so they, they took those tools, mass mobilization, church-based organizing, um, litigation, um, direct action protest, and they, and they took that to Jackson, Mississippi, Orlando, Florida, South Carolina, just throughout the nation. And, and so, so Montgomery was the place where that formula was hammered out and then replicated in, in what we know as the, as the Civil Rights Movement. Montgomery, Alabama has made a dent that few other cities in this nation, if not this world, can claim the title to. Montgomery, Alabama, and that's why we want people to always, wherever they go, to feel proud of telling people, not just I'm from Montgomery, but I'm from that city that made a difference. I think the, the fact that we stood together in Montgomery for 381 days uh, was inspirational for people who also thought that they could um, generate some of the same feelings. And um, uh, Ernie Green, who was a friend of mine, one of the Little Rock Nine, said that he was inspired by Montgomery. And most of the people that we talked to that were a little older than me and college students and that, uh, they were inspired by uh, what happened in Montgomery. In fact, Montgomery's, this movement impacted the world stage. Uh, in fact, there were other movements around the world that said that because of what happened here in Montgomery, uh, they would, uh, uh, especially uh, in Africa, in fact, all around the world, um, people sought to, to have a nonviolent movement. So you can see when all of these people come together, and I don't think that's an accident. That's the reason I said fate would have it. I don't think it was an accident that Joanne Robinson gets here in the late 1940s, that E.D. Nixon's already here, so he knows the turf. Rufus Lewis is already here. He knows the turf from the east side of town, E.D. Nixon from the west side of town. And then you bring a Fred Gray back to town who's already committed to tearing down the walls of Jericho. And then you bring in a young minister who turns down a job in Chattanooga and decide that he would come to Montgomery instead, this quiet, peaceful city, to complete his dissertation. And did he write a dissertation? In fact, people are still writing dissertations on MLK, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. So what I'm saying is simply this. It is amazing the kind of combination that we had in Montgomery in 1955 that came together as never before in the history of this city to fight for justice that people all over the country today enjoy the results of. And it all started in Montgomery, Alabama. And just think, had it not been for Rosa Parks, who becomes the face of that challenge, what might have happened if we had not had a person with an outwardly quiet demeanor? And how many people have become intoxicated by that outwardly quiet demeanor to assume that she was equally quiet on the inside? Rosa Parks was anything but that. But they don't f uh, remember or even focus on the fact that this was a Christian lady. This was a lady who read the Bible. This was a lady who loved gospel singing. This was a lady who, who believed in justice. She just was not bombastic in her approach to things. One of the most prominent persons that we talk about today <laughs> The beginning of his involvement in civil rights, we can trace to the Montgomery Bus Boycott years. When Dr. King appeared on radio on Sunday mornings to preach, 
that sermon could be held, could be heard throughout the area. And if you lived in rural Alabama, I guess even to this day, your church service might not begin at 11 o'clock. Your church service might begin at one o'clock or whenever the pastor arrived. And in one of our neighboring counties, a young boy heard one of those sermons of Dr. King, Paul's letter to the American Christians. And he was so impressed with that sermon. On that day, he decided to devote his life to civil rights. And I think if John Lewis was here today, he would tell you just how much he appreciated hearing Dr. King preach that sermon. So that's the kind of impact the Montgomery Bus Boycott had, not just on people in this town, but in the surrounding area. And I think John Lewis is a good example. If you look at the Black Lives Matter movement and you say, well, what, what, was, what were the defining features of it? And it was mass mobilization, protest, nonviolent resistance, you know, um, lobbying, pushing for legislation. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it wasn't as based in the church as the, as the earlier phase of the, of the, of the movement was. Um, this manifestation was a bit different in that, in that facet. But other than that, it, it, it mimics the, the, mod, the, the 1950s and 60s in, in a variety of different ways. And so it directly informs. And you, you, could, you could see this even in, the, even in the bus boycott where you have students who are freshmen in 1956. They step into a Montgomery in the midst of a, of a full-blown bus boycott. Right, and they attend these these um, nonviolent direct action social um, workshops, and they learn the theory and the philosophy behind nonviolent resistance. And then, when they become seniors in 1960s, they participate in the sit-ins. The same students, right? They had, had sat at the feet of you know King and the other um, um, movement. Um, luminaries and and they understood the, the the approaches and employed them those approaches themselves and then you see that that lesson sort of continued people you ask people what are the you know talk about the um, Martin Luther King and the bus boycott and they'll say generally I mean really not only in the, in the United States we get visitors from all over the world they kind of know Martin Luther King and the Montgomery bus boycott and they could tell you what, what people protested, they picketed, they, they boycotted. Just so that's all, that's direct action, mass mobilization. So they know the features. That's part of the American experience now. It's part of what it is to be an American now is that this is one way in, from, a, from a constitutional perspective. The Constitution says you have the right to redress government. And this is the way that people now redress government and to put pressure on their political and elected officials to change those laws in a way that reflect um, the nation that we aspire to be. The problems that we have today are basically the overall problems are the same. We had two problems when we were brought here as slaves. One was racism, and they didn't bring white folks, they brought black folks. And two, it was inequality. We didn't have any rights. And what all of the groups have done from slavery time forward, including Reconstruction, was to continue to try to improve and peck away at doing away with it. Police brutality is nothing new. It's been here all the time. We're going to have to still continue to work with it. But it's not a one-man show. If you go back and look at the bus boycott and look at the, uh, the civil rights development, or the civil rights movement as it has developed, you'll find that it took a lot of people. There was the lawyers involved. There were the people making speeches. There were people who were demonstrating. There were people who were doing a lot of different things, not just out jumping out there by yourself, but work on it, make a plan. So I say to all of us,
that we still have these problems involved that we had then. A lot of them have been solved. They're not nearly as difficult as they used to be. But we need to come up with a plan. One, we need to acknowledge that racism and inequality is, is wrong and it needs to be stopped. If we had not, if Joanne and I had not done what we did in her living room that night, that would have been, I'm sure, a civil rights movement, but that would have been. And if Mrs. Parks had not done what she did on December uh, the 1st, she wouldn't have been arrested. There would have been no, she wouldn't have been tried on the 5th. There would have been no bus protests. There would have been no meeting at Hope Street Baptist Church. Dr. King would not have been, uh, would, not, would, would not have been selected to be the speaker. And of course, Claudette Carvin had done what she do, had done and gave all of us impetus and encouragement to go on. So we have to have a plan. Once we have a plan, you've got to implement the plan. And once you implement the plan, you have to remember that each one of us has got to be a part of doing away with it. Fred Gray made a difference. And that's why we can talk about Claudette Colvin and many other persons because in Montgomery, there was a civil rights attorney for the first time. I, I would like to believe that as a youngster, I was able to recognize some problems that existed in Montgomery, Alabama. And those problems were racial problems that African Americans were involved in. Not only that, but I had enough sense to realize that lawyers are supposed to help people solve problems. And I had enough sense to become a lawyer, to come back to Alabama, and with a lot of help along the way, we were able to help to change the conditions in this country. And that's what I have tried to do for these uh, 67 years. And I hope others will be able to see that whatever the problems are, if you work toward solving them, who knows, you might be able to start a movement.